Well, good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. good to see everybody. Um, let's go ahead and get going. We're back. This is the final week of the March equipping class. And I did say, whoo, the last two weeks has been pretty heavy. I know last week um, it took me three days to get over uh, just what we went through. Ben said it took him three days also. So uh, today is a little lighter. And I think it's going to be a, a lot of fun. But just for those of you online or anyone in the class, uh, you know, for as long as we went last week, if you look at the condensed version online, it's like 48 minutes. And again, I tried to add a lot more uh, slides and background quotes and things like that in the editing process. So uh, that's out there for weeks one and two. Uh, but this week, let's go ahead and finish. This is week three of uh, extra biblical sources, how we use them. And today, really representing contemporary literature. Uh, the, I initially thought of this and I thought, well, this is eh, it's not going to do it justice. Uh, to look at C.S. Lewis as a representation of contemporary literature. But the more time I spent on it this week, uh, the more I'm convinced that it's the only way to do it. And I hope that's what we find uh, today as we walk through it. In fact, as we look at this, I've sort of titled uh, the approach to what we're going to be doing this morning as the uh, influence of C.S. Lewis by way of the influences on C.S. Lewis. I don't know if I think that's original. I'm not sure if that's a t-shirt or a bumper sticker or something, but uh, maybe that makes a good book or something. But uh, I, I just started working through it. And I thought, wow, this is really something. Um, who's heard of C.S. Lewis? You ever been in a sermon or in a teaching or just in a conversation? And hey, did you know C.S. Lewis said or uh, who, who's read C.S. Lewis? Something by C.S. Lewis. Most of us who's read more than one book by C.S. Lewis. Okay, that kind of gets the lion, witch, and wardrobe out of the way, right? Okay, <laughs> and that's such a tiny, tiny piece. So I, I think this morning, uh, what we're going to see is th this is a man um, who is considered by most to be perhaps the most influential uh, author and influencer of Christian thought in the 20th century, for sure, possibly of all time. This is a lay person, not a trained pastor or uh, so-called theologian, though we're all theologians. And um, what we want to see is I want to walk through this high-level survey of his life and interject the influences at that time in his life on what I'm calling the essential readings of C.S. Lewis. And you're going to see how his life experiences played a part in what he actually put out for us to read. And uh, I hope it's an encouragement to us, not, not only the introduction to some of these sources, but also for you and I, uh, that as we're moving through life and experience all of these things, some of them uh, really, really amazing uh, that, um, you know, maybe God's speaking on our heart uh, to go deeper, to, to think more thoroughly, to be mindful, as, Christ, as, as Lewis would say, mindful Christianity. And so that's, that's really the approach. And... Um, <laughs> That's what we're going to do this morning. Sound good? Okay. Again, right place? Okay, good. All right. So let's start. So C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis, Clive Staples Lewis. He only went by C.S. when he wrote. In fact, his friends knew him by Jack. And, and I'll often go back and forth. You'll hear me talk about Jack pretty much this entire session. He had a dog when he was young. His dog died at the age when he was four. And his dog's name was Jaxie. From that point forward, C.S. insisted that everyone call him Jaxie uh, because of the dog. Well, eventually, as he grew in his childhood, they convinced him, you know, let's just call you Jack. And he said, OK, the rest of his life, his friends only knew him as Jack. Uh, and then, of course, he only wrote as C.S. Clive Staples Lewis. He was not English, as most of us might think. He was actually born in Belfast, uh, Northern Ireland. So he was Irish, 1898. He had one older brother, Warney, uh, Warren Lewis. He always went by Warney. Warney was about three years older than Jack. Uh, Warney would go on to be a British Army officer and a historian. Uh, C.S. would say that Warney was perhaps the most intelligent individual he had ever been around. And to give you an idea, this is where these influences start to begin. His, his childhood was one for which his mother was a religious Protestant in Northern Ireland. His dad was, was pretty uh, ambivalent to uh, organized religion. He went along with it, but he was an attorney. 
Uh, and I believe he worked civil law as well, something in the government perhaps. But he was a very intelligent man as well. And um, they, they had a, a very, uh, you know, above average uh, life there in Belfast, except for the personal relational aspect of that. Uh, Warney and Jack were often left to their own means around the house outside of their mother's influence. And a lot of that uh, really uh, was a matter of being in books. He, was, uh, he talks about always being surrounded by libraries and libraries and books. And so even as a child, six, seven, eight, nine, as he learned to start reading, he, they would just go and grab books. It was all about reading, all about reading. But the types of books that he especially loved were those that gave him a lifelong passion for something called anthropomorphism. <laughs> anthropomorphism. What does that mean? He, uh, your eyes are... Well, God's a spiritual being. He doesn't have eyes, but we use that because it makes sense, right? But to any inanimate object, Ted said it well. Talking, talking animals. animals. You know, one of his favorite series of books, he would say that it influenced him significantly as a child, were the, the books, the series by Beatrix Potter. Anybody know who that is? Peter Rabbit. Peter Rabbit. And that he would just spend hours and hours reading these books and then playing out, making make-believe as a child. And so you, you kind of see where this is going, right, in, in his future writings, especially those that we were uh, familiar with. Well, he's 10 years old and his mother dies. Um, his father and the boys already had a somewhat distant relationship. This makes it even more cold. This makes it even more distance. They're left to their own. Uh, they end up being sent to uh, various boarding schools, 1910 in England, Hertfordshire, and then another place as well. And so the boys are sort of just passed on to others for their education. C.S. always said that as a child, in grade school and above, he was really just an average student. Uh, he loved reading, but he was an average student. And, um, but through that experience... The loneliness, sort of the isolation from his dad, his mother dying when he's 10. By the time he graduates the boarding school, before he begins his uh, higher school learning uh, at Oxford, he now self-identifies, proclaims himself to be an atheist. That he says that, uh, th that there must not be any God, that he denies Christ, he embraces atheism, and he says, as he writes in his book, The Problem with Pain, if God were good, he would wish to make his creatures happy. And if God were almighty, he would be able to do what he wished. But the creatures are not happy. Therefore, God lacks either goodness or power or both. And so this, this book, The Problem with Pain, is a book that he writes from an, an atheist perspective. He says that he can speak of it because he certainly remembered what Christianity looked like from the outside. He talks about it as being his journey from religion to atheism to Christianity. And so that's, that's, he'll, he'll publish this later, uh, and I believe, well, in 1940 or so. So it would be after he returned uh, sort of to a faith, or what he would say the first time to a faith. And, but for 15 years of his life, he would um, denounce any faith and uh, denounce any God and, and be a uh, very publicly open atheist. Okay. Did, we, did we know that? Were we familiar with that aspect, some of us? Maybe not all of us. So uh, here's, here's Lewis. He's distanced from his dad. He, he gets sent to a couple of tutors who really encourage him to grow in his understanding to the point that he gets a scholarship to Oxford. Uh, he always says that the reason that he grew from an average student to uh, excelling in studies, or at least in literature, was the influence of a, a certain tutor. There was a tutor that ended up being in his life, but also his, um, his willingness to read books. You know, we started with that with the, the, the quote from Charles uh, Spurgeon on Paul, uh, you know, telling Timothy, bring the books, and that even Paul needs to read and how important it is. Uh, Lewis would go on to develop that uh, philosophy of chronological snobbery. Uh, he would say that, you know, we should never read two, two new books back to back, that we should always insert an old book in between all of our new books. Instead of reading about Plato from some contemporary, read Plato. Uh, he said, you know, new books have never have not stood the test of time. They've not been given a fair trial. 
And later he'd say, hey, I'm a writer, and I wouldn't read two of my books back to back. <laughs> and he, so he, he, would, um, he would say that that was really an aspect of his, his education in those years that uh, developed him, that, that sort of brought him to a point of, uh, at least in his education and his thought, uh, his ability to think uh, more so than others who were around him. And so all this is coming together. Uh, uh, he goes to Oxford. He has this, this love for mythology. And he really uses that within a concentration on English literature is going to be his study. And so all of this is coming together. He's, he's, he's got a problem with pain, the suffering in this world. So he rejects God. He has a love for mythology and literature and books, and anthropomorphism, and sort of the, the living that out. And he, he just really, really starts to focus on the idea of Greek mythology, Old English mythology, and especially Norse mythology. Do you might know what Norse mythology is? Yeah, you know, in modern day's terms, it's that guy, right? Anybody recognize that guy? Thor. And it's funny because later he will say that uh, Jesus, to him, uh, was as the stories of Loki, uh, who is apparently Thor's brother. Uh, so he, he had all of these mythological thoughts, but they would eventually lead to his uh, conversion as well in a very interesting way. And so it's all, all coming together, this, this beginning of a lifetime of English lit and mythology and everything else. Well, he's digging in, loving it. His first year, he's studying all these, all these intellectuals around him. And what happens in 1917? World War I. Lewis was Irish. He was not required to enlist or to, uh, to join the fight. But he felt because of his connections, his friends, his, his, uh, his reliance on Oxford, that was, he was as much English as he was Irish at this time, and he enlisted. And uh, in um, 1918, about a year in, he had been in the trenches uh, on the Western Front, and a German artillery, artillery shell exploded, had a sergeant, had some others around him who were killed in the attack, in the explosion. He survived, but he took a lot of shrapnel. And so he was sent back to England where he uh, recovered. I believe it's six, six months to a year or so that he's recovering uh, through this, uh, this war accident, this incident. And uh, he's medically discharged at that point from the war. So you can imagine all of these thoughts are still, I mean, now you got uh, just sort of compounding the idea that how can there be suffering in this world uh, that's thrown on him. And so he recovers, he finishes his studies. In 1925, he gets a position as a fellow at Oxford. I, I don't know the academic structure all that well, but sort of the, uh, the, the TA of the, uh, the college campus, right, in literature. Uh, he, he did a lot of grunt work. He probably didn't get paid right. In fact, I think uh, it talks about he got paid just enough to get the dorm room on campus they gave him. And uh, so, um, but he was loving it, right? And so he gets in, he's a fellow at the Magdalen School in Oxford, which had a rich uh, history of literature, uh, was where he spent most of his time for these next several years. Still an atheist, still struggling with the idea of suffering in this world but loving everything he could, he could dig up on mythology and, and literature, Renaissance literature, medieval English, all of that sort of aspect is what he spent most of his time on. And then perhaps, and this is one of our first great lessons, I think, for us in, in the life of C.S. Lewis, is that uh, he met a fellow fellow. <laughs> I don't think he was a professor yet at this time. He may already have been a professor, but he met a, an individual who would become perhaps his closest friend and the, the greatest influence on his life in Oxford. Does anybody know who that is? <laughs> John Ronald Rule Tolkien. Uh, Tolkien. And um, Tolkien was a professor of literature. He was a professor of language. He was on staff there at, for the Oxford Dictionary. He was an, uh, is it etymology guy? Not entomology, but etymology, the, the study of language and words, right? Um, of course, if, if you know his works, Lord of the Rings, he, he also sort of created his own languages. He was one of these guys that just sat down and created languages. At the dictionary, uh, he was responsible for the W's, <laughs> and he worked through the W's. Big fan of Old English, big fan of, get this, Norse 
mythology. <laughs> Bam! Can you imagine the day those two guys met? It was like, you and you? I never knew there was another one like me. Right? Big difference. Tolkien is a devout, practicing, upstanding Roman Catholic. Lewis is a devout atheist. They became the best of friends. He would say that I wanted atheism to be true. And I am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. You imagine this? This is a college campus in the early 1920s, mid-1920s, early 1930s. And the problem with their uh, academic staff is that most of them are believers and an atheist is having a hard time fitting in. <laughs> Tolkien, as you know, his life work would end up being sort of this mostly all around the Lord of the Rings. He would say that they aren't allegorical. They weren't intended to be an allegory of, of God's story. But they were, uh, as his words, they were fundamentally religious and they included many Roman Catholic themes. So he was, he was, uh, uh, you know, he was, he was conscious of the idea that he was inserting uh, good versus evil, that he was inserting some aspect of redemption and the story of, of, of Scripture without it being an allegory. And so you have all the Lord of the Rings saying, so he, he meets J.R. Tolkien. And on September 19th, 1931, after many, many, many talks with Tolkien and others, he takes a walk with Tolkien. And they walk along this, this river there in Oxford, and uh, they have this conversation about mythology. And this, again, is where uh, Lewis is saying, you know, the idea of Jesus and all these teachings of him, uh, to me, is no different than what we hear about Loki and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so. The way that they are, the spiritual aspect, the way they make you feel, all of those things, uh, they are myths. And so they're having this conversation about mythology when Lewis, in, in what is my, uh, my favorite, favorite book, and let's see, it must be in the uh, um, compilation here, Surprised by Joy, talks about his conversion to Christianity. He says that it finally, at that point, it dawned on him that really what was being say, said by Tolkien and lived out and believed, and that I then realized at that moment was that the life and death and resurrection, that it works on you of Jesus. It works on you in the same way as mythology, but the difference is it really happened. It truly is the only true myth. And Lewis would go on to use that phrase often. That Christianity was the true myth. And so this conversion comes about. And, you're, and in his book, Surprised by Joy, he talks about how uh, the, the actual surprise of a conversion to Christianity, of receiving Christ in his heart, was a joy he could never have experienced prior. The problem with pain, suffering in this world. Dad, even when, when Lewis was wounded with shrapnel and he's in the hospital for six months, dad never came to visit. Mom dies when he's 10. The war's going on, right? And here's Lewis, devout atheist, who experiences this joy at the moment that he realizes who Jesus is. Wow. Now, now, now we're moving in a different direction uh, with Lewis. And so he would begin this sort of um, uh, authorship now. Right? He always wanted to write, but he feels like now he has a purpose. And his very first work following his conversion is something that is called The Pilgrim's Regress. The Pilgrim's Regress. Anybody? Yeah, that's probably a good reason. <laughs> You, you know, uh, and I've been guilty of it, right? You, you learn something, you get into something, and all of a sudden, oh, I just, I, I want to share it. I just, I want to talk about it. I wanna, and I really don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> he, he's, he knows what he's saying. It's truthful. But what he tried to do in Pilgrim's Regress is he tried to take the old classic Pilgrim's Progress, uh, the journey uh, to salvation for Pilgrim. And what he did with Pilgrim's Regress is he tried to put his own sort of from uh, religion to atheism and back to Christianity. 
and how that movement to and for atheism, and he kind of used it as that allegory, and it's, it's a difficult kind of first attempt, but it was an attempt. He's trying to declare to the world now uh, that he is a Christian, and this is a little bit of his path in a fictional way. So the pilgrims regret, he, he writes that, and then he writes this uh, non-Christian work called The Allegory of Love. Uh, and again, I know this is probably the genre we all really uh, desire, but it was a treatment of love in the Middle Ages. Whoa. If you ever want to experience love in the Middle Ages, this was, this was all that Lewis had to say about what that would have been like. Okay, So he, he, he introduces that, but it's, it's not so much that it was a work or not a work of faith or you know, in the family life store. It was more a matter of you can feel and sense his heart, the disposition of his heart toward the world is changing. And in, in his, his mood in his writing and his studies is changing because of the change in his heart. And so you start to see a lot more sort of thinking about the idea of love. Where does that come from? And then he writes perhaps one of the more surprising reads. And this is early on, right after the conversion. Um, it's a trill ends up being a trilogy, but he writes the first book, uh, which was Out of the Silent Planet. And this is all three in here, but the first one. Anybody read any of these? You have, Seth. Great, great trilogy. Good. I'm so glad to hear you say. Yeah, I... Um, when, when I did a, some work on Lewis and this was recommended as the first read, I was like, oh, man, I, I've never read the Narnia. I wanted to get into that or all these other mere Christian. And uh, they said, no, read that first. I was like, really awesome. Really encourage it. It was really encourage. So what Lewis was trying to do in his own words, he was trying to smuggle Christianity into a good story. Those were the words he was trying to use here. He was trying to make it a, and, and he used this on the book jacket too, I think, a modern fairy tale for grown-ups. And he uses the themes throughout, again, a redemption theme, a creation theme, Perry Landra, I think, is the, uh, the, the one that uses that. The second book, uh, just a really interesting, fun read, is, is a first work by Lewis. So he kind of gets a, a home run here, good versus evil, um, grace uh, all of these things you see in here are, are really good. His first attempt for uh, more of an allegory kind of aspect of that. And so this is going on. And, um, and then the next most influential aspect of Lewis's life is that he works with Tolkien and others to form this group called the Inklings. The Inklings. The Inklings in the early 1930s had been a literary society at Oxford, undergrad. It, it sort of dismantled. And about a year later, Tolkien and Lewis and Charles Williams and Owen Barfield sort of start the core of something that would last for 20 years. In some form or fashion, every Thursday they got together as a literary society. And generally, these four were considered core to it. Williams was a playwright and a poet there in Oxford. Uh, Barfield uh, was called the, the first and the last of the Inklings because of his just his endurance in it and was there most of that 20 years. Over time, there'd be 10 to 12 others who would come in and out. Uh, Warney would spend time there and a couple of other uh, well-known authors. Very diverse in their backgrounds. Most of them were Christians, but this was a place where they came and they said, hey, what are you working on? Read some for us. Woo, tear that up and start over. Which is what they told Lewis about Narnia when he first introduced it. Okay. Um, it was a bit why Tolkien kind of held back on sharing his uh, Lord of the Rings concept. But it was just something they just iron sharpening iron in this literary circle. Poets, professors, um, they were challenging the narratives. They were encouraging fantasy, though. Uh, just not in the way, not in the anthropomorphized way that Lewis had talking animals. <laughs> they weren't real hip on that yet. Uh, and so uh, they would meet every Thursday at uh, either Lewis's dorm room or they would meet usually at what is still there. You can go uh, have fish and chips, I guess. Uh, there at the, uh, the eagle and the child, affectionately locally referred to as the bird and the baby. And so... They would, uh, they would have this meeting every Thursday. Uh, I'm sure that the, the pipes would be lit and they'd get their writing books out and they were the inklings. Uh, really, that reference sort of those who dabble, hobby, have fun with ink. 
And uh, so this would, this would be a major influence on um, Lewis's life, some of his writings. And um, then, yeah, World War II breaks out. Well, Lewis is obviously not in any condition. Uh, I'm sure he's a bit aged out but also based on his medical discharge to really get involved in the war efforts. And so um, one way he did agree to help the war efforts was the BBC religious broadcaster, the guy who was in charge of religious broadcasting at the BBC, had read The Problem with Pain. He had read the fact that uh, uh, Lewis suffered with uh, suffering, <laughs> that, he, that he, as an atheist, had seen the world and what was going on and said there can't be a God, but yet he still found Christ after that. And so he got a hold of Lewis and he said, hey, how about coming in and we would like to just do a series of, of talks, a series of interviews with you about what's going on from a Christian perspective. Let's do four talks and we'll call it a night and just let's just see what happens. Well, about 600,000 people each night listening is what happened. And they said, did I say four? Let's do five. And they said, did I say a series of five? Let's do three more series. <laughs> and these were hugely impactful. Uh, in fact, they would go on to make up what many have called uh, the most impactful, most influential single work in the history of Christian literature. Does anybody know, without looking at your sheet, if you haven't looked at your sheet already, uh, all of these talks, their transcripts were then compiled into a book called Mere Christianity. Mere Christianity is just exactly what it is. And I want to read you an excerpt here in a second. But um, Mere Christianity is Lewis. In fact, let me start with it because this is no better way to understand what it is than uh, to hear his introduction. He says uh, in his introduction, I think this is hugely important. The reader should be warned that I offer no help to anyone who is hesitating between Christian denominations. You will not learn from me whether you ought to be an Anglican, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, or a Roman Catholic. This omission is intentional. Even in the list I have just given to you, it is in alphabetical order. There is no mystery about my own position. I am a very ordinary layman of the Church of England. Not especially high, nor especially low, nor especially anything else. But in this book, I am not trying to convert anyone to my own position. Ever since I became a Christian, I have thought that the best, perhaps the only, service I could do for my unbelieving neighbors was to explain and defend the belief that has been common to nearly all Christians at all times. This is mere Christianity. The basics. What is faith? What is hope? What is heaven? I, I love one thing on, on hope that became well known about heaven is he says, um, most of us find it very difficult to want heaven at all, except so as far as heaven means meeting our friends again who have died. One reason for this difficulty is that we have not been trained. Our whole education tends to fix our minds on this world. Another reason is that when the real want for heaven is present in us, we do not recognize it. Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. That is heaven. Oh, oh that's a 20 talks of just explaining, really, um, in an informal way, the Apostles' Creed. What, what ties us together, links our arms uh, from the very beginning, beginning, beginning as believers. Um, mere Christianity. Well, mere Christianity... After it is published, 1950, I believe, somewhere in there, on the list of top 100 Christian books of the 20th century by Christianity Today, Mere Christianity is number one. It's followed by Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship, Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics, J.R.R. Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings, uh, Politics of Jesus, Orthodoxy by Chesterton, and so forth. Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. Okay, This is the list of 100. However, also... And this is common on most lists, the top Christian books of all time by Share Faith Magazine. And I'll tell you, I searched many, many, I searched pastors rank, uh, theologian, you know, scholars rank, uh, every list you can get. And this is pretty much the same for all of them of all time. Number one is Pilgrim's Progress, which Charles Spurgeon said he must have read a hundred times. It was his favorite book of all time, uh, Bunyan's. Number two, Mere Christianity. 
It's followed by the Confessions by Augustine last week, followed by J.I. Packer's Knowing God, Cost of Discipleship, Edward's Life and Diary of David Brannard, which is another, we could spend a session on Jonathan Edwards. That's a great one. Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, Orthodoxy by Chesterton. Um, which, by the way, this is a little insert. Uh, I've had, we've had individuals in our church, I think this is, this is just wonderful, uh, who have kind of said, I, I didn't really know what to read. So I just started looking at, you know, what, what have pastors read? What are the top 10 books of all time? And just worked its way down that list. That's a good way of doing it, too. If you don't really know, talk about alternating old and new and old and new. Th that's a good way. But mere Christianity should certainly be uh, at the top of the list. And that's, that's what comes out of these broadcasts. And um, additionally, the war is still raging. And Lewis decides to take on this other just really uh, hotly debated topic. Uh, you know, a little bit of tension in this controversy. He writes... Before in 1942 or so, the screw tape letters. Anybody? The screw tape letters were actually written as a series of newspaper letters um, to the Guardian, which was a British Christian weekly uh, during the war. And so each week he sent in a new chapter of the screw tape letters. And each week, uh, you know, screw tape, the senior demon, uh, would speak to Wormwood, the junior tempter. And tell him to go after the patient's soul, the believer's soul, the guy he was assigned to. And it really originated out of, you know, use the war to win his soul. And then it goes throughout the book as, you know, well, that didn't work. Let's use this. You know, let's use pride. Let's use politics and division. That surely gets most of them. It's, I'm telling you what, it is a convicting read. Uh, it's, it's entertaining for sure, but it is more so a very convicting read. It is probably one of the more convicting reads uh, that uh, Lewis ever put out. Um, if you haven't ever read it, um, that one's definitely worth the read as well. So really, really impactful. The screw tape letters. He also will write The Great uh, Divorce, which is a, uh, a fiction. It is a true allegory about a bus ride from hell to heaven. Fascinating, huh? <laughs> he's getting into it. He's wow. It's that's a good stuff. And then lastly, he writes his second book of the trilogy of uh, the space trilogy. Well, all of this now is culminating into Lewis becoming a worldwide sensation, especially among uh, believers, but among the academics starting to get a little consternation in, in, at Oxford because he's getting, you know, we have believers, but we don't need to be this outspoken, Jack. Let's tone it down a little bit. You're going on the radio. You're writing these books. You're, you're talking about, and this was the big, ah, in the room. You're talking about devils in public. You know that's taboo. You know, some of us don't even believe that. And some of us that do don't want to talk about it and give them, give them the, you know, any credibility. And, and so there's, there's sort of this really world reaction uh, to Lewis. Time Magazine, this article is fascinating too. You can find this online. Uh, but one excerpt says that since 1941, when Lewis published a witty collection, yeah, the, inter the screw tape letters had just written, a collection of infernal correspondence called the screw tape letters, this middle-aged he was 49 at the time and 47. Bachelor professor who lives a mildly humdrum life. I like monotony uh, to Lewis. Has sold over a million copies of his 15 books. He has made 29 radio broadcasts on religious subjects to an average of 600,000 listeners. Any fully ordained minister or priest might envy this Christian layman's audience. And so he kind of is, is out there now. And I think sometimes it's lost on us just um, how influential. Lewis is just in the general culture and, and society. Um, they, um, they say that mere Christianity and screw tape every year since has sold at least, and even as of this last year, has sold at least 150,000 copies a year. Those two. It is one of these things that just kind of kept, kept building and building. So Lewis is, is so influential that uh, in a visit in the early 50s, Billy Graham himself made a point to stop in and, and have a, a conversation with Lewis. And this is Billy Graham saying this. I was afraid I would be intimidated by him because of his brilliance, but immediately put me at ease. He put me at ease. I found him to be not only intelligent and witty, but gentle and gracious. And that's really, I think, 
when I read more and more about Lewis, I think that's really the, there's a humility there. There's wit in his writing. There's brilliance. There's intelligence. But he was just a, a really warm, I think, um, he was a mama's boy, so to speak. Technically, as, as you might define, right, growing up under his mom's wing, because his dad was saying, I don't really want that much to do with you except send you away. Um, he liked to play with those animals and, and just sort of had that sort of uh, sweet spirit, we would say. In a way, he, had, he was a very old spirit uh, at, a, at a young age. And so I think this became his personality and how he would uh, ride into it. Uh, and then, you know, it was 1950 when he began his first book in, the, in what would become the series of Narnia. All right, so Lion, Witch, Wardrobe. Anybody's read that or seen the movie? <laughs> Pretty much everyone, right? Has anybody read any of the other six? Anybody read all the other six? Just one or two of us. Just a few, right? Yeah. So, interestingly, Lion, Witch, Wardrobe was written first. And then, over the next six years, chronologically, Lewis kind of does the prequel, then the, the what are they, sequels? or pre Yeah, back and forth, prequels and sequels and prequels and sequels. He bounces back and forth so much, don't even pay attention to the year it was published. If you're going to read them, this is the order you read them because it tells a continuous story. The Magician's Nephew, which was written next to last, is really the first book in the series. And then The Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, The Horse and His Boy, Prince Caspian, The Return to Narnia, The Silver Chair, and then The uh, Last Battle. The detractors really for Lewis was that he wrote just too much about war and conflict and battles. Now, it makes sense when you put yourself back into, I mean, he was a double World War, you know, uh, soldier and then a citizen. And so that was very part, much part of his influences. And he saw no issue with it. He, he always saw... A, a need for a righteous victor. He saw a need for good to always win out, and it wasn't always pleasant. And so these books especially, you know, the, the, the last battle, that's the final book in the series, right? And throughout, we see the swords fight. We see uh, Aslan go down. We see all kinds of stuff, right, that sort of draw back from his, this is what a, a, a worldly battle might look like in this land of Narnia. And, and he's inserting all of that in there. Uh, any thoughts? Let me just stop there for a second. Yes. Uh, in fact, I know someone in our church right now who is walking through the series with his child. And uh, little M Wilson's out there. Uh, so I know Wilson's enjoying uh, the uh, Narnia series. Uh, this is a wonderful. I've heard people before read these, you know, with their kids or their grandkids. You know, start with that first book and do a chapter or two. And they have a children's version specific. And so uh, just some really great reading if you're going to be reading something like that to them. Well, so Narnia comes out, and um, after that, he meets an American lady, lady from New York, Joy Davidman. Uh, in 1956, he marries Joy Davidman. And uh, right before that, this is, it was sort of uh, coincidentally, he had been working on a book called Surprised by Joy. <laughs> Not connected in any way. <laughs> But again, Surprised by Joy is probably my favorite of the 30 plus books that uh, he has authored. And it's an autobiographical, particularly his childhood. But then he talks about that moment, that influence of Tolkien and what happened on that walk. And then uh, how he has experienced that joy. He said, in fact, I like this. He said, the transformation in Christian life as you come to life, real life, belief, and you see that all of it. All you had experienced in love and pain and grief, they all culminate in this one special joy. That's what surprised me most. And so it was that joy of that internal, that transcendence uh, that could only come from being transformed with the, with the Holy Spirit. And so he, he writes this and then he gets married and he puts a couple other books out there I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about that um, I'd recommend. Uh, he writes a true sort of uh, rewriting of a past myth. Okay. Uh, he, he tries to incorporate some Christian theme, but this is a book, Till We Have Faces. I believe the original is something like that. And it's about Cupid and Psyche. And so it's kind of this really interesting, if you've got anybody who likes reading Greek stuff and, and uh, myth kind of stuff, uh, this is what he wrote as a, uh, a rendition of that. 
It's a retelling. It's a myth about love. He wrote this with Joy. Joy Davidson helped co-write this one with him. Okay, then he puts out the four loves. Mm, a little more controversy. Today we'd look at it and go, what? What, what kind of controversy? Well, he talks about the four loves as, as a believer, affection and friendship, erotic, and God's love. Now, it's that third chapter that really got a lot of people in uh, 1957, <laughs> 58. And uh, so he talks about the aspect um, really of intimacy uh, between a couple and how that is a gift uh, of one of the loves that we experience. And so uh, that was a book that he wrote, well known uh, as well. And, uh, and then Joy dies in 1960. She had cancer, much like his mother who died from cancer. And she dies in 1960, very short-lived. He obviously didn't marry till late in life, and then it was a very short-lived uh, uh, marriage. But he and, and he goes into um, some some you know we call it depression today. And he eventually would say that the only outlet after, out of what he was feeling, never denying his faith, always always sensing the joy of, of Christ, but he would he would put it all out there in a in a book called a Grief Observed. And this was a collection of all his thoughts and internal uh, feelings. And you see some real humanity here on how he processed death and how he processed Joy's death. And so that's, that's again, I, what's so beautiful about Lewis is there's, they're all over the spectrum on types of books. You know, you can, I, I have people come to me all the time and say, hey, I'm looking for something on. And I, I can automatically kind of go through the Lewis catalog and go, okay, yeah, right here. Right. He's like a whole collection in himself of various genre. And so a grief observe is a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful book there as well. Um, shortly thereafter, Lewis would die in 1963. He dies on November 22nd, 1963 of kidney failure. What else happened on November 22nd, 1963? Yeah. No one, no one even knew that Lewis died that day. It's, again, Time Magazine all over the world. But uh, it was completely lost, likely as it should have been, in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. He is buried at uh, an Anglican uh, parish in Oxford. Did not return home. Again, furthered the dissension from his childhood and his, his, his father and that sort of thing. And Oxford had become his home. Although, uh, because of the tension on campus... In the mid-1950s, uh, actually, Lewis transferred and took a job at Cambridge. Uh, he was not getting promoted at Oxford. He felt like they were holding his faith against him. They were holding uh, what, he, you know, he wasn't saying this at sort of in an um, upset sort of persecution mode. He was just sort of coming to the realization that he was never going to be, you know, the, a chair here or a chair there or the head of a department at Oxford. And uh, he had been told in no uncertain words that you, you're just a little bit too controversial here. And so uh, Cambridge was happy to take him on uh, medieval and Renaissance literature. And uh, he became the chair there. And so for the last eight or nine years, he, uh, he was there at Cambridge. But he returns to Oxford, the Anglican parish there. Uh, he's buried. And there are a couple works that, well, there's many works, but two especially that are work uh, that are uh, published posthumously, Right. Following death, one was called uh, these letters to Malcolm. Letters to Malcolm, he had been writing were, were you kind of get a theme with him too on this. They were, he was writing as if letters between uh, two individuals um, uh, who were meditating on what prayer was like between God and man. And they were meditating on the, uh, the sort of intimacy of that dialogue between God and man. And these were the letters back and forth with Malcolm. The other one that is just a total, again, different type of read. I love the excerpts. It's a hard one to find these days. Uh, but it's called a Letters to an American Lady. There was a lady named Mary, and I always forget her last name. She's from Atlanta, Georgia, of all places. Lewis was known for writing people who wrote him back. He loved writing letters. I mean, you can see in his writing. This lady writes them in 1950. And for the next 13 years, they share at least 100 letters that are preserved. Never met her, never met her, never indicated any sort of affection for her other than she was a poet and an author. And they shared some literary conversations, but um, sometimes it was about faith. 
Sometimes it was about dogs and cats. Sometimes it was about I, one of my favorite readings is a letter he writes her about the commercialization of Christmas. Uh, in, in, in a sense, he writes, it's, you know, it's, it's come to that time of year that I am totally disgusted to ride downtown. The storefronts and the this and the that and not a single sign of, a, of the birth of our Savior. I have despised this time of year more than any other. And he goes on just beautifully, eloquently, but uh, it's in this letter. And so they share those kind of letters. And that's a, that's a great read, but this is published after his death too. Uh, letters to an American lady. What can we learn from this? What can we learn from Lewis? How can we um, actually grow do you think? What are some thoughts? About yeah, that? yeah. It's a good way of training up um, because often it's, it's you know, it, yes, our, our grandchildren are, and our children should sit and we should be able to read the book of numbers to them and they should sit quietly and listen and take it in and say, train them up in the way they should go. They're more likely going to sit when we, we start talking about that trip to the wardrobe, right? And <laughs> which if I told that in here, I, here's another one Mr. Wilson will like online. Um, what, what was, you know, what were the witch and the lion doing in the wardrobe anyway? Did I tell that one already? Well, it's none of your business. <laughs> Compliments of Wilson Warren out there. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> that's a good one. All right. So that's great. Yes. Any, was there something else? Yes. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, I think that the more I, I look at his life story, it's that, you know, and, and those who came around him, like you say. And, and today, there's several points of that. We might just say, you know, if our neighbor comes over and says, oh, Jesus is no different than Loki and Thor. Are, are we still okay with engaging with them and speaking life into them and taking long walks along the river with them? And uh, what a wonderful way, Tolkien. And or are we okay in saying, well, no, you're, you're a Methodist. I'm a Presbyterian. We, we can't really have this conversation. You're a Roman Catholic. I'm a pro wow. The most influential author, Christian thought, perhaps 20th century or ever, was converted by friends, different denominations, who said, we still want to share Jesus with you. It's amazing. That's an amazing story. Testimony. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they say that, that journaling is a wonderful spiritual discipline. And, you know, Lewis was certainly writing letters like that. And today our, our mode may change. Maybe it's typing it into a, a digital journal or whatever, but just allowing us to think through and process and all of that. Yeah. Well, a couple of things, you know, this class was about extra biblical sources and how we can and can't use them. And so I want to share just a couple things here in closing with that is I think Lewis teaches us through these sources to think often about God. Mindful Christianity, to, to think uh, relative to the heart and the mind, um, our faith, to be aware of it. You know, Lewis would say, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. The worldview, the lens that Lewis would have and, and take on the world, his filter was always through Christianity and through Christ. And so we think about those things. I think we also can learn, this is what Brian was saying a little bit, to think about joy, to think about grief, about pain, about hope, about what Lewis would call divine yearnings. And he called those that he said that our heart, this was part of his, his evidence for faith, for his evidence for God, was that our heart yearns for something earth can't supply. And so are we thinking about those things that earth can't supply and then processing through them? Um, to imagine the bigness of God. And this is the real beauty because, you know, one end of the spectrum, you, you could say, oh, you know, these are there's some fantasy there. That's just silly. You know, we, we, we got to get back into the reality of it. But really what what Lewis did and, and these authors put it right. Lewis said, um, you know, Lewis said in our humane. Uh, humane. That doesn't make sense. In our humanness. We are humane. We try to be. But in our humanness, we are finite. We cannot comprehend the immensity of God. Others would take that. And they said about Lewis, these authors said that Lewis takes what we know about God and he ultimately makes that more vibrant and larger. And it's more vibrant and larger. And God is bigger than our individualized, nationalized, materialized images of the divine can ever be. 
We, we, we make God small just in our finite, um, you know, our, just our bodies and our minds and who we are. And, and Lewis says, think beyond that. Think beyond that. It's okay to see how big God is and, and how small we are. And then the last thing I think is in, uh, this is, I think, beautiful, to welcome the deep, diverse fellowships, particularly among believers. And this is what, like the inklings, uh, welcome the diversity in thought, welcome the diversity relative to faith, but also in life among believers uh, to where we're, we're growing and, and we're having iron sharpening iron. Mere Christianity is also that excerpt. If you remember in the church history class, I ended the whole four sessions by reading an excerpt from C.S. Lewis and Mere Christianity about uh, the need for denominational rooms where we sit with the fires and the chairs and all that. But that the never to forget that the goal of our Christianity is in the open foyer in the front door to all and that it's in the foyer that we gather and meet and share our common Mere Christianity and then we go to the rooms, but never forget that the objective is bringing people into the foyer. And that's what I think he welcomes us to in these deep, diverse fellowships as well. I listen to R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul says the Christianity of C.S. Lewis is a mindful Christianity where there is a marvelous union between head and heart. To be creative without distortion is rare indeed. Why is influential? I think about Al Mohler, who is president of the Southern Baptist Seminary. He says, to be sure, Lewis is not orthodox on some important matters. He is not always right, but he is nearly always worth considering and engaging. He is sometimes wrong, but it is always worthwhile. And, and to that, Lewis, you heard him admit in mere Christianity, right? I'm a layman, either high or low, but I'm a layman, and I know what the essentials of our faith are. You know, you listen to those who are well studied in scripture for the interpretations. But I'm going to tell you, you know, from this perspective, and some will say, well, he didn't really speak to the theological significance of the atonement. Uh, or some will say that he kind of had this wishy-washy free will. Uh, was it election? And, and he never got into that. That was never his intent. And so I say, read, read Lewis, but understand that we're not getting all of our doctrinal you know, uh, uh, staples there. We're, we're not saying, oh, Lewis said it, it must be doctrine. We don't say that about any human author, which is I hope we've learned over the last three weeks. But they help, they help move us forward in our thinking, right? And then um, lastly, you say, all right, there's a lot, there's the styles, there's all kinds of books and, and, and of Lewis and we can learn a lot. Where do I start? Where's the best place to start? Well, there was a conversation between Tim Keller and uh, John Piper, and they ultimately ended on this one thought for the question of where should I start? I say, just read everything. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you can't write anything that is uninteresting or unhelpful. And this, if after the reading, you're still interested uh, to go beyond this survey, there's a slew. This is the gold standard of, of biographies by Alistair McGrath. Uh, there's several books on the Inklings. Uh, this one is by Carpenter. My favorite is by Colin DeReese, The Oxford Inklings. There's the stage play that was out there, which is a one-man stage play, which is awesome. And then recently, the movie. I think, you know, it was shown locally. I'm sure it'll be out and available. We'll try to get it in the library soon, too. The most reluctant convert, what he called himself. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I want to be an atheist so bad, but I just can't. All right. Well, hey, thanks so much. And uh, let me close in prayer.